Dr. Roman Politsky, welcome to the Jewish Psychedelic Podcast. Hi, Rabbi Zach. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Uh, I want to start a little bit about your own background before we get into your field of research and our project together. Um, but is there something in your personal life, your background, that drove or continues to drive your particular research interests? Well, uh, I think when I describe my research interests to people, I think more and more I think of an octopus, uh, where I'm. It's all swimming in the same direction, but there's a lot of different tentacles that are a part of it. <laughs> and uh, I think for me, uh, you know, I I'm just endlessly fascinated with what the mind makes out of the world, and to me, a huge part of that is the culture that we grow up with, that we interact with one another through, and that helps us make existential meaning out of the world. Um, and also, you know, I'm, I'm really drawn to these limit experiences that we have, uh, you know, whether it's through something like meditation or psychedelics or uh, spiritual experience or practice. Um, so I think in, in my personal life, these have all been very important and influential for me. Uh, uh, culturally, uh, I'm an immigrant, uh, and I've always been really fascinated with culture since I was a little kid. And culture was my, you know, little map for figuring out uh, how people made sense of the world around me. And I think I'm kind of, uh, I'm the kind of person who's been around a lot of folks who've had these limited experiences, and I've had a lot of them myself. And so I've always been really curious about what makes that work, what about that is relevant and important, and what about that is maybe, you know, we shouldn't take too seriously and uh, focus on other stuff. Can I ask you just to be clear for myself and maybe for people who are listening, what exactly is a limit experience? You gave some uh, examples of them, but what would just be the definition of that? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it, it's hard because I think different people have different ways in which they use that. But if you think of the ordinary, uh, the ordinary terrain of your experience, where your thoughts tend to go, how you tend to feel about things, you can think about it like a sort of a circle, right? And there's there's the stuff that you're sort of used to, and then there are some things that push you all the way out to the limits, to the margins of that circle. And beyond that are things that you have a hard time defining, knowing, understanding. Uh, so those kinds of experiences that take you to those limits and maybe even beyond them, uh, which can be very positive, falling in love can be that way, uh, but also something like trauma can be that way, right? And so those are all I would think of as limit experiences because they take us to the limits of what we recognize as the world and ourselves. Well, forgive me if this doesn't land quite right, but was coming to this country as an immigrant with your family, was that a kind of like early limit experience for you? It feels like the circle of where you were born and where you grew up and going way far out of that. Um, certainly you know, my, uh, my experience as a young person in a community where we absorbed Russian Jewish immigrants. I was on the other side watching it, um, and we were in deep connection and relationship with these families and these kids my age, but I never really got to understand the experience from the other side completely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think... It was a, it, it's sort of a succession of limit experiences. and. A lot depends probably on if you're a kid, what the adults in your life are doing and if they're making it seem manageable and sort of just a part of ordinary life, it feels like ordinary life. And if it feels big and traumatic, then it can, from their standpoint, it can be that way for you. So I was very lucky um, uh, it, it, in, in that everything was always kind of explained and ordered and uh, buffered for me. But still, I mean, even, you know, the foods, the languages, the the new schools, uh, just moving so often. Uh, yeah. we, we moved dozens of times during that, that time of my life. Yeah. 
I remember clothes being a particular item of, uh, let's say, like adolescent inquiry about you know, why these Russian kids were wearing these particular clothes. Um, and it was a marker of difference. Like these are our siblings. They have come from far away in terrible conditions. And now we're here to take them in. And yet something so, um, so external, something like so clear about cultural and maybe even class difference. Um, was that your experience in some way? Oh, absolutely. I have a sort of a mortifying story. Uh, this is, you know, we used to go to these gatherings at the synagogue with my mom and my mom got this like really nice dress and somebody was complimenting her on it. And they were like, oh, that's a great dress. Where'd you get it? And I could like, my mom's arm was like snaking out to cover my mouth. <laughs> and I was like, I flirted out, we got it at a yard sale. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Everything was secondhand. Everything was a hand-me-down. Um, and I think that's the other side of that, uh, of that limit experience piece that I've actually found really valuable because there's also um, two mentors of mine, uh, this guy, Michael Jackson, and this guy, David Carrasco. They're both, uh, they're both uh, uh, anthropologists and social scientists. And they use this language, they call it border dwellers. You know, that there are some people who are kind of border dwellers and there's, you can live literally on the border right between so we can think about the border lands between the us and mexico uh we can think of other contested areas but then some of us kind of live on the margins and in the spaces in between and you can have these things like clothes right where you know if you've got these immigrants and they're among us but they're also not like us mm -hmm. and they're sort of living on a border land as well hmm. well i can maybe like draw some clear or squiggly dotted lines to at least this part of your story, um, which is very dear to me, um, just because you are, but also my own background. Um, the relationships between personal identity, family identity, culture creation, and the role of religiosity as well in the formation of all of these things, whether, you know, on the liminal spaces and what's beyond that, or what is part of the, um, what we will call the, the, uh, the host culture. Um, and so I'm interested because we'll talk more about some aspects of your research, but how did you make the jump to these questions about religiosity and uh, formation of personal identity to psychedelic research? Um. You know, I I kind of have a, uh, a similar question in the back of my mind about, you know, your own journey in a way, because I, you know, it, I, I think for many of us and tell me if tell me if I'm totally off, but, you know, there's a point where you kind of make the movement into working with psychedelics in a more formal way. Uh, but there's also maybe something in the back of your mind that's kind of been there moving forward over time. And I don't know if that's a. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I, can, can I, uh, I have an answer, but I I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've thought about this as well. I mean, uh, people who have been listening or people who know me, um, you know, I speak very openly now about my own personal, uh, mystical type experience encounter with the mystery, the beyond, uh, spontaneously and, uh, something that I couldn't negotiate with, uh, that I, you know, had to integrate, um, over the next, uh, 20, 30 years. Um, but I can also think of some other moments. Uh, certainly I, I think of some of my friends in a, a log cabin just over a weekend around a fire and spontaneously chanting and all of us feeling some sort of collective effervescence that we had to, in the moment, I remember like asking, is this real? Like we all feel something has shifted. Am I, am I, am I going, am I going somewhere that I, I can't come back from? 
And so holding that together, but even in moments of like early cannabis use in high school and after a party or after like going out with friends and just being quiet in my bed and maybe listening to music and with my eyes closed, you know, those were potentially some of my first psychedelic experiences, uh, noticing patterns of thought and noticing particular imagery that was forming and dissolving within my mind, feeling my body and breath in ways, but not really thinking much of it at the time, just like, oh my God, I'm too high to go to bed. Don't forget to breathe. That was a huge thing. Don't forget to breathe. Um, so yeah, that's part of my story. And then what happened was I was a participant in a research study. Um, but what about you? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think similarly, and th there's, you know, in, in, in some traditions, like in Buddhism, you know, they recognize that there are these sort of states, you know, call, they call jhanas, right? And mm -hmm. they're actually quite, uh, they're not all that rare among kids, right? Kids will spontaneously experience these sort of jhanas and, uh, which is, which is basically like a state of being, uh, kind of, uh, very, um, very deeply concentrated to the point where you can be aware at a different level than you ordinarily are. You're not as caught up in the sort of mind stuff that we're constantly producing. And that gives you suddenly these, you know, vast realizations of unity of transcendence, uh, what feels like making contact with the nature of things. Right. And so for me, yeah, I was one of those kids where, um, I had these experiences and I really treasured these experiences. And I was around adults who, again, were able to contextualize these experiences for me in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think I've, I've always been kind of drawn to what that means. Um, I became really interested in religion and spirituality, actually, because I was interested in psychology. Um, I, you know, coming up, I really, I thought that if you want to know about the world, the best way to know about the world is the mind through which people know the world. Uh, that was my view. I, I'm sure if you asked a chemist, they would say that the best way to know about the world is the chemicals that make it up. But I'm a psychologist and to me, the mind is really it. And I was taking a lot of psychology classes and then I started, I took like randomly a, uh, a course in religious studies and it kind of dawned on me that over thousands of years in these religious traditions, people have been taking apart and putting back together the human mind in a fairly systematic way over, you know, learning uh, sometimes by trial and error over generations about how it is that the mind works under different circumstances and really providing a very deep repertoire of strategies for navigating uh, these kind of exigent, uh, exigent situations. Um, so that rekindled uh, very strongly my interest in a kind of formal pursuit of uh, religious studies and study of spirituality uh, to the point that it took me to divinity school, <laughs> you know, um, and, it, and, and, I, and I still, I, th I think that that's very, uh, that that's very true. Um, I also, I, I've had recurrent interest in studying, you know, altered states of consciousness, uh, psychedelics also throughout. And now I can say uh, that I'm pretty grateful that I wasn't able to do it earlier. Mm. I think that uh, one thing, and, 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 you know, this is still accruing. It's still very, uh, um, I think it's still a lesson that I need, <laughs> but I think that I've gotten it a little bit more than I did before, which is just the importance of like, just re recalling your humility, recalling how little, you know, about anything and just being cautious about making too much of any given experience or phenomenon. Um, and I think that I have a little bit more of that now than I did before. And maybe I'll have a little more of it in 10 years than I do now. Well, something that has uh, really struck me about your research when I became aware of it. And then uh, we had the occasion to speak about it together uh, at Psychedelic Science uh, in Denver uh, last year um, was not um, kind of the 
kind of the, the hype machine of what psychedelics could do for us uh, spiritually or uh, as a mental health intervention. Um, but what was really necessary to take seriously um, in terms of the, the care seeker, the, the journeyer, the participant, and whatever context someone was engaging with psychedelic medicine, and just the level of specific kinds of cultural, religious, and spiritual caregiving that would be required for the best possible outcomes for uh, a, a patient or someone even in a, a research study or a clinical study. Um, I want to encourage people, and we'll put it in the notes, uh, to please read this very well-written and researched paper uh, called The Importance of Integrating Spiritual, Existential, Religious, and Theological Components in Psychedelic-Assisted Therapies, um, or CERT as the acronym. Um, I, this is all by way of saying I want to kind of move on just a little bit to our work, um, but it, it was your work in uh, CERT and also your research on the implementation of mindfulness interventions in other research projects that you did, uh, as well as your kindness and openness, of course, that uh, I reached out to you with an idea about researching the state of play of psychedelic use in the Jewish community in the U.S. And after we received a grant from Common Era, which is the research and development wing of the Jim Joseph Foundation last year, we've been crafting and honing a research project called Jewish Journeys, which is a population study of attitudes, practices, and needs of Jewish Americans towards psychedelics. So given your uh, plate being incredibly full, you have all of these interesting projects that are happening. You're uh, doing trainings, you're uh, overseeing all of these other projects that are happening through Emory. What about this project, Jewish Journeys, excites you in the context of that other work and the wider field of religion, spirituality, and psychedelics? Um, I think in the context of the wider work, this project is really, <laughs> I think it's the kind of research that we really need to be doing in this, uh, not just in psychedelics, but in, again, in, in the study of these uh, really impactful experiences uh, from uh, in spirituality and religion. Um, you know, Broadly speaking, I think there's been a lot of very good work done in the study of mystical type experiences, the study of religious experience that uh, really try to understand what is it that makes a religious experience so powerful and how does it affect people? And a lot of it, you know, you, that goes all the way back to William James and earlier, right? Really, um, uh, trying to see whether there's anything special about these experiences, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I've been a student of it and an appreciator of it for, uh, for many years. Uh, I also, you know, I think over time, and, and this is really credited to my uh, really learning in religious studies, right, and sort of studying from religion scholars, um, that I actually had a lot of things wrong in my original kind of expectations about mystical type experiences. Um, and I think, you know, as psychologists, we inherit these, uh, this model of a mystical experience that first a human has an experience that experience, uh, Maslow called it a peak experience is foundational and people then turn these peak experiences, they integrate them to use common parlance, and then it becomes kind of this, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it manifests in social structure, in behavior, in sort of formalized ways of thinking. Um, so it's experience first and sort of culture and structure and behavior later, right? And that has a particular genealogy that goes all the way back to sort of the origins of Protestantism in Europe, where, you know, Martin Luther kind of had this sort of sola fide faith. You, you, you need this faith experience in order to kind of really be, uh, to consider yourself a Christian, right? Um, and the, the legacy of that is this intense fascination with experience as the basic unit of, of religion. Um, 
we had these people focus, uh, the, the, the scholars and scientists focusing on mystical type experience. It gave it a set of criteria and those criteria also, interestingly enough, really match that kind of uh, sort of post Protestant way of thinking, right. Of, ab about what this experience is like it's unitive, right. It is not or non-dual, right. Um, it, it has this, uh, uh, this noetic quality, you learn something, something is imparted to you, it's transient. So all the things that James talked about. Yeah. Um, this is all enshrined in the uh, mystical experience questionnaire, which is the research tool to measure these experiences. Yeah, which is which is now, like if you run a psychedelic study, you almost have to give people the, the mystical experience questionnaire because everybody's doing it and it's kind of become a common unit of measurement. But what that leaves out of course, are all of the experiences, again, the, I'm just always interested in the margins, in the periphery, right? So what about possession? If you're in South India, or if you are sort of in an Afro-Caribbean religion, what about these possession experiences? Well, that's a very, I don't know if that really fits the bill of this typical mystical type experience, right? You might not have a complete one. What about, you know, when people actually speak quite uh, readily, right? Where, when language is present. So we know, for example, and, and anthropology uh, research uh, with, 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 uh, with Mazatec uh, practitioners with psilocybin say, well, it's not as ineffable as we seem to think out here sort of in the US and Europe. And so, you know, we start to see these different kinds of narratives around psychedelic experience and mystical type experience that don't fit that mold because they don't fit the mold. Historically, they've been excluded, right? They don't count as much. And I think right now the onus is on us to reshape the common narratives around psychedelic experience and to make space for the many different kinds of voices that are a part of it. And that's where I think Jewish Journeys has a lot of good to do for the for the world of psychedelic research, for understanding religious experience and phenomena in general, uh, because I think it creates space for all of the narratives. I think that it creates space for uh, really impactful psychedelic experiences that may be impactful, not because you felt unity right there during that trip, but because in the days and weeks afterwards, you noticed a kind of uh, a gradual building of relationship with the natural world around you, right? This kind of heightened sense of, uh, you know, animistic interaction, right? That we sometimes talk about with psychedelics, right? Well, that's not in the MEQ, right? But it's so important and probably, I would say, more important, maybe. Well, we'll definitely get into what we... Um, want to measure in terms of uh, Jewish psychedelic experience and even just curiosity, non-experience, but why people are curious but uh, have not yet used these substances in any way. Just to follow up on your sense about the MEQ, do you think that this measure as deeply embedded as it is in psychedelic research culture, but also in kind of like the larger psychedelic culture, um, like certainly I've seen psychedelic churches point to uh, data from various uh, MEQ data sets as being proof positive that uh, you can have a reliable mystical religious experience um, through, let's say, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Do you think that these uh, measures are somehow determinative of the experiences that people are then having, like it becomes self-confirming in some way? Yeah. Oh, gosh. So this is actually, these are conversations that we're also having with some of the uh, clinicians and researchers in the area of, you know, that this is making its way into the training of facilitators, right? This is making its way into sort of the preconceptions of people coming into, you know, a psychedelic experience. Um, I would say, like, how can it not, right? Um, and part of it is, I, I think, especially in the clinical world, but I, I also think this is true in the religious practitioner's world, where when somebody comes to you with an experience that is so disorienting sometimes and so big, right, when you don't have a way, especially when they're struggling with it, when you don't have a way to give language to it, to give some kind of, uh, to give predictability to it, 
it's very uh, anxiety provoking for the practitioner, right? For, for the therapist or for the spiritual health clinician or for the, uh, for the guide. And so we reach for language. And that language, I think if it, it, part of that language is, is this MEQ, this mystical type experience. Um, and we, we sort of set up these expectancies, I do think. And something I, I would just, I would pitch to folks who are working with this and who are coming in also as patients and kind of thinking of, well, we like, we know, and I'm putting no in scare quotes, we know that a mystical experience is what causes, what makes these therapies or uh, th these journeys uh, helpful to people. We know that, right? And so if I don't have one, if I don't make that connection, then I didn't get the benefit. And I would just lean into like, well, what is the value of a non-mystical psychedelic experience, right? And 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 the, and there is, there's a lot of value there, but because we we look at the shiny thing that everybody cares about, we can sort of miss the the sort of the negative space in the in the room. Mm. And I think that's why also the uh, the tools, the language, the the habits of chaplains. And chaplaincy, I think, looms large in that paper that I mentioned earlier as well, which is non-directive, which is kind of mindfully responsive to the needs, the statements, uh, the larger kind of matrix network of relationships of the care seeker, rather than the frameworks and the you know the beloved frameworks of the practitioner. Um, so, you know, there's, there's still a lot of room to grow and learn uh, for everyone. And, you know, we're just getting started. Transitioning now, I think, want to get into the specifics of uh, our, our research project. What is Jewish Journeys trying to understand about Jewish psychedelic use? And what, if any, uh, are your hypotheses at this point about what we are going to find from the data, given what we are actually doing and what you have seen in other studies that are like this? So um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to share this in two pieces. One is what we hope to find, which is actually just a much bigger slice of the pie. And then there's the hypotheses. Maybe I should ask you about that first, because so here's the perils of doing social science. People listening to this may then yeah, go. Of course. To Pause, the, right. No hypotheses. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to also say that verbally in the because, but yeah, yeah, no hypotheses, sure. Right. Uh, Thirty, no three. So, transitioning now to our study, um, what is Jewish Journeys trying to understand about Jewish psychedelic use, and uh, what do you think we might encounter from the data given your experience in this broader field? Uh, well, what I'm really interested in, I think that this is one of the areas where our interests are really commingled is what do people need, right? What are people needing who are maybe feeling like they're journeying on their own in some ways, uh, even when they're journeying with others, um, people who, are it, well, what are people looking for in terms of perhaps Jewish psychedelic support? Uh, I'll share that in a clinical trial that we just finished here, uh, we had uh, some participants uh, who belong to religious communities. And after the psilocybin experience and the integration, they were like, gosh, I really wish that there was a community. So this is a Jewish participant. Uh, I wish that there was a Jewish community I could speak with, that I could connect to who could help me make sense of these kind of spiritual ripples in my life in a Jewish way. And I mean, I, because I know you, I, I shared, I shared about Shefa, but I think there's probably a lot of people like that out there. And I would love to know what it is that they're looking for, uh, where they feel that their needs are not yet being met. Um, so, so that's a huge, uh, part for me about the study. Um, I also, I think as we kind of hinted in this, uh, discussion, I think that there, there are a lot of stereotypes about what a psychedelics user is. 
and maybe even what a Jewish psychedelics user is. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people out there who don't fit those stereotypes. So, um, you know, we, we think of psychedelics users as often being kind of on the more secular side, on the spiritual but not religious side. And I'm very curious about the folks out there for who do fit that, that mo model and mold. And I'm curious what their experiences are like. And I suspect that there's a lot of folks who are actually quite committed to a Jewish life who also have a lot of psychedelic experiences. There's a few things. Um, and you're I know not, you're experiencing this on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, interesting to see, like, again, like the limit experience comes up with this interesting commingling of psychedelic and ultra orthodox for example there's like a huge community i think very well organized um you know of a particular identity with frequent psychedelic use and very like maybe low information or low skills but high use um and then that's like a very clear needs uh case um and absolutely i mean this is why I, I wanted to do this research and, and do it with you is that mostly everything that we have encountered through Shefa, uh, people coming for integration, people coming for you know preparation and, and ritual design, people wanting to learn about the Torah of expanded consciousness, uh, or even being a participant in one of our ketamine circles, um, people are looking for uh, a culturally specific, uh, spiritually responsive uh, space where they don't have to explain too much about themselves and their motivations and can feel much more vulnerable and free uh, to express themselves without fear of judgment uh, or needing to justify being Jewish. Uh, for example, you know, even just in a this nine week class that course that we ran um here in berkeley you know it was also like a safe haven uh in the time between the two october 7th that we've had and so my sense is that people who are differently committed to jewish life differently committed to jewish observance at the end of the day are looking for someone who understands and that they can connect with um naturally, I guess. Um, so we'll see how all of these things shake up. I mean, I'm particularly interested in the fact that we are trying to account for the ratio of uh, engaged or served Jews, which is about 30% of the American Jewish population, uh, against the underserved or unserved population, which is about 70%. And to still see what comes up for the 70% with regard to Jewish identity, uh, Jewish uh, suffering uh, or trauma, um, their desires to participate in Jewish life, whether it's just with their friends or in a larger community or not. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, it, if it is psychedelic use in some ways like a, a placeholder for some other Jewish engagement, which would be really amazing to see, because we're also seeing that with people uh, that are not Jewish. Uh, we're seeing that psychedelic use is taking the place for many, not all, um, is taking the place of uh, some sort of engagement or membership in uh, a formal religious tradition. Yeah, yeah. I think there's this there's this sort of idea rolling around that w as psychedelics become more popular and there's all these books and movies and you know all this material and maybe there's going to be some decriminalization or legalization or something that because of the propensity of these compounds to cause these transformative spiritual experiences that it's going to hit religion by storm, right? That it's going to transform the shape of religious life. Um, I think that's a, you know, maybe a very ambitious <laughs> expectation, but, but I think that it is going it, to, it's going to have uh, a lot of impact. And we know that, you know, from the, the sort of the, the, the good Friday experiment, right. That a lot of those people who were in that study, right. They went on to be, you know, massively influenced and to have very influential lives. 
So among those folks who are in that 70%, for example, who are uh, less connected to Jewish institutions, right? Um, you know, I'm really curious about those folks because uh, in my own life, I've experienced, and I've talked to many, many people who've experienced this, where on one hand, you can have a mystical type experience, to use that language, that takes you out of formal religion. That's kind of my story, right? Early on, I was having a lot of these experiences and they didn't fit within the sort of very uh, orthodox uh, yeshiva that I was in. And I, I, I chose the experiences. Um, but at the same time, I think I, I meet folks, especially maybe who have a few years under their belt, who've done a little bit of living, and they have these experiences and something gets rekindled for them. And a curiosity emerges and like, well, it, 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 it's not all trash. It's not all useless. There's something really, really important here that I need to find a way to return to or revisit or actualize in my own life. Yeah, I guess, you know, we're, we're interested in all of it. So we can say you know, all the things that we're excited about. Maybe I'll uh, talk about the, maybe it's not the, uh, the analog, but in like more observant or more uh, ultra Orthodox Jews who are using psychedelics. I'm also um, keenly excited to know if psychedelic use actually brings people away from what I would call like high authority structures and uh, regimented practice toward more personal autonomy that is, I don't know, catalyzed by direct encounters uh, with divinity or uh, you know themselves out of reality. Um, you know, not to again, I don't want to do the same thing as the MEQ, like to start priming people's experiences, but I've heard enough stories that I'd like to formalize it with some data and some interviews to be able to show this is the broad range of what is happening mm -hmm. for people. We need to take all of them seriously and here's why. So maybe just to ask then, um, how might the data that we gain uh, impact or influence the field of psychedelic research on the one hand, and how might it benefit the Jewish communal world, especially in this moment? It, well, the field of psychedelic research, I think we, we just make, we make a lot of assumptions, you know, we have to, because we don't have data for a lot of stuff, but gosh, we're, we're just making assumptions left and right about how, uh, how people are, how these experiences are integrating into their lives, um, the, the cultural and religious backdrop to these experiences. So the short version of that answer is hopefully it'll help us to make slightly fewer assumptions about what's going on in people's lives who are using psychedelics um, and, and therefore be more responsive to the spiritual and religious needs of, uh, I'm a clinician, so, so the needs of patient populations, right? But more broadly, I think just to people who are affected by, by psychedelics and are interested in them and who have a relationship with them. So, um, so I think that that's for, for the field of psychedelic studies. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's a small, but I think very meaningful piece is, is to be able to make fewer assumptions about the backgrounds and the lives of the people we're talking about. Uh, for the Jewish community, I, again, it, I think it all goes back to uh, meeting, meeting people's needs. And so you can think of a need for uh, information Right. So we don't know what people don't know. We don't know what people's sources are for their information about psychedelics these days. And that could be very, very useful to know kind of where we're getting our information, how reliable is it and uh, sort of what opinions are we forming based on those sources. That leads to other that, that, that's directly connected to other important parts of our community, which is a uh, need for acceptance, right? need for understanding. Um, and that is both, you know, understanding of, uh, people who may never be interested in using psychedelics, but to realize that your nephew or your grandpa who has gotten into psychedelics, right. That they're not like, you know, getting into hardcore drugs, 
um, and 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 have a problem, but that you know they're kind of doing a um, perhaps something that they experience as holy, right? Um, that that's a very different register to to operate on and to be able to to recognize um, in those dynamics that we all have in our families. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and and so you know I, I think finally also j just a, a need for uh, for these kinds of um, uh, resources, uh, in whether that's support. Right, whether that's guidance and teaching, whether that's uh, a community as resource, right, whether it's to have an online community or an in-person community, um, yeah. Well, I'm really excited. First of all, uh, about our uh, our survey, our team, um, the people that we've been working with and talking to to make sure that we you know get this right, um, and I'm. I'm very excited to share uh, our our measures with other researchers who are interested in looking at other communities, uh, religious communities, spiritual communities, and otherwise, um, because I think our data, yes, will be valuable for our own purposes, our own communities. Um, but once we can start comparing data between religious communities and experiences, that is going to be wild. Um, and that is kind of a, a new stage, I think, in the research of religion and, and psychedelic use. So stay tuned for that. This is uh, becoming like a 10 year project. Um, and for the Jewish communal world, yeah, especially uh, cultural competence, certainly empathy, but also the training of spiritual caregivers to be better informed, in, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say you know, the majority of spiritual caregivers that I know and encounter have not had these limit experiences to the same uh, degree of uh, you know, psychedelics, uh, maybe in meditation, and maybe have just gone uh, unnoticed. Um, but to actually begin to appreciate them uh, in a way that there really hasn't been for uh, some time in the Jewish communal world, the Jewish religious world, uh, with the advent of rationalism and um, you know, keeping decorum like our Protestant neighbors in, in synagogue and not screaming and uh, banging on the walls as much. Um, and for, for rabbis, for pastoral caregivers uh, to, be, to be there, uh, for their congregants and for their students, um, because I think we're only going to see an increase of use over time, especially as you mentioned, with all of these uh, legal landscapes shifting. Who knows when anything will be uh, approved by the FDA? Um, but it, these things are coming, and if they're not coming legally, they're happening in the underground anyway. So it feels like you know the mitzvah of harm reduction. Uh, to be able to be open uh, to what people are actually doing um, so that we can have an adult conversation about this. And can I just jump in? Uh, you mentioned something that, that, that sparked uh, the, let me remember you, you, you were talking about uh, sort of relevance and importance for other, for, for the field of psychedelic research. And I'm like, I can't believe I forgot to mention this. Right. But um, of course, the Jewish Journeys study is one of a number of different studies that is working with uh, religious communities, right? And uh, in the past, when we've had studies with psychedelics and spirituality, it's kind of lumped people together, <laughs> oddly enough. And again, it's kind of this basic assumption. There is one type of mystical type experience or psychedelic experience. And what we're doing, even though I think it's very obvious that it should be done, it is strangely innovative and different, which is we are looking in depth within religious communities. Uh, and that will allow us to do the kinds of comparisons you're talking about to kind of, to talk to our, you know, Muslim participants, to talk to our uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints participants, the Mormons, um, to talk to, uh, Christian participants. 
and you know not necessarily even compare but describe nuance elaborate uh build out the, a uh a responsive vocabulary of psychedelic experience hmm. so then maybe all the more so the fact that we're um putting an emphasis on those underserved unserved people who might not re- identify as religious or spiritual and jewish nevertheless that there might be kind of undetected data for secular uh lds people or you know, people for secular muslims um that might not uh be appreciated uh otherwise so um there is yeah. also then a, a really uh exciting conversation about secular religiosity um, that could happen in this context. Yeah. And all the lessons that we're learning while doing this research together, right? That is, uh, you know, we're sharing those with our colleagues and collaborators and that way they don't have to reinvent the wheel and they don't, you know, they can go and say, oh yeah, you've got these ways of looking at secular spiritual experiences. I want to do that too. And that's why we get to do this, this broad uh, kind of uh, rainbow of, of, of uh, re- religious orientations and perspectives. Well, I'm really proud uh, to be your collaborator. Uh, I'm glad that uh, this project has brought us together uh, as thought and thought partners and maybe soul brothers. I, I haven't called you that yet, but feel that way. Um, and maybe just before we leave, uh, can you say a little bit about uh, your love for uh, sacred singing? Oh gosh! Wow, that's a <laughs> right way to start. Um, oh, I um, I think that it's kind of emerged. I've I've always uh, I've always been struck by the voice, um, and uh, there it actually it wasn't it wasn't Jewish sacred singing for a long time because in my you know uh, Sanskrit mantras and things like that have. Uh, always really struck me. And then kind of out of nowhere, I started to kind of be exposed to Nigunim and uh, to like, uh, you know, this is maybe one of those um, uh, ineffable things because I think it gets me in a place where I, I don't really have very good concepts around it, but when I'm in it and when I hear it and when I'm a part of it, 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 it it's, it's, it's like a stone that drops to the bottom of a deep, still pool of water, you know? Uh, and that's how I feel. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Yeah, same. Uh, so we have a lot to look forward to together. Um, collecting data, publishing it, uh, sharing it with our communities, singing together, um, and many more projects uh, to come, I think. So thank you again, Dr. Roman Politsky, and uh, we will hear from you more, I think, when we publish our study. Thank you so much. So good to talk to you.